bed anyway. You don't want to lie in bed like a vegetable and do nothing. I've tried it. What do you need? What do you want? Can I not just live here without having to occasionally deal with you animals? Coffee time. Care for a cup of Wilkins coffee? No, I don't like coffee. I need another cup of coffee. That was not the right intro. I don't know what happened. <clears throat> I, I had a different intro, uh, but that was the old intro, the old new intro. Well, whatever. Who cares? Good morning, everyone. It's, uh, I'm John A. Douglas. So welcome to a bit of a long overdue morning coffee stream. Just a good morning chill stream. I'm going to get my first sup going here because, mm -mm -mm. boy, do I need it. I still, yes, I'm still using the uh, chicken soup bowl uh converted into a new coffee mug i stole this at the christmas white elephant game it was hilarious there was no chance i was letting it get away from me thank you for everyone who's joining me and to all the views that are popping up. i figured this out last night i mentioned this for a couple of streams now that i have uh on my studio here in Streamlab. i have an eye in the corner of my screen that tells me how many people are watching the stream and for the last three weeks uh, ever since I really started streaming to X, it's steadily climbed up into the hundreds. And I just assumed that those were bots watching for some reason. And it's not. It's people who are scrolling past my uh, scrolling past my feed and they see that I'm live. And that counts as a view. I don't know why when they're not watching it, it doesn't go away. It's very strange. But I finally figured out what that is. Because I'll be looking up here saying I've got 250 people watching me live. And, you know, the comments don't really reflect that. So I figured something wonky was happening. It's just it's people seeing that I'm live and scrolling past it on Twitter. That's all there is to it. And uh, I wish they would stop and watch. But I don't think a lot of people really use X to watch people. I certainly don't. Um, I usually use it to show on X that I'm live on YouTube and Rumble. That's about the best use that I've gotten out of it. But. It is what it is. <clears throat> Honestly, I'd feel better if you guys help me grow on Rumble and go over there, leave a comment and a like and all that not usual nonsense. Uh, I'm trying to grow on Rumble, and I need to get some gaming streams on because that's where uh, a lot of growth is happening for you know uh, people who are streaming. Uh, I was actually having this argument with uh, Royce on uh, my timeline not that long ago because he's saying, you know, and, and he's right, Rumble is growing, but uh, most of its content is political based and that's not how it's going to grow. It's nice that it's, you know, more free speech and all, but it does need the more slice of life stuff. Why are people at, uh, why were people attracted to Facebook and Twitter and uh, YouTube? It was the slice of life stuff. It's pop culture stuff, you know, talking about books and games and cat videos and barbecue videos and all that other stuff. And he's right. There needs to be more of that. <clears throat> To which I say, if I don't put my stuff on there, there won't be that kind of content on Rumble. So, you know, um, I'm trying to help Rumble grow in that regard. I was initially, Rumble was like my number three. When I first started streaming, my thought was YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey, a three-tier, uh, you know, kind of a, a attack on all the uh, stream, on all those streaming platforms. Odyssey got its nuts chopped off, unfortunately, so... Uh, that place isn't really viable unless somebody with some acumen and, and you know vision gets over there and starts uh, building it back up because it's got a great app. It's got a good infrastructure, but it's kind of rudderless. It's like a boat in the water with no captain at the moment. Uh, it's just kind of a good backup. Uh, you know, it is what it is. Rumble's kind of shot up in the last year, year and a half. But anyway, let me say hello to everyone that's here. Because it's impossible for me to tell unless they're, they're leaving uh, something in the chat. If you're not a bot, leave a comment in the chat so I know you're not a bot. <laughs> Hello to Paladin and Dragoon Writer. Dropped in first thing this morning. Press S to spit on Jokitaku. Yes, we will be discussing that shortly. Bat Sauce drops in, says beep, beep. Christopher Brand drops in, says afternoon. Got my coffee ready. He's across the pond over there. I got my coffee ready, too. I'm indulging in it. Hmm. Uh, when it's just right, just the right temperature, just the right consistency of coffee and cream. Mm -hmm. Gotta love it. 
My good friend William, the Bald Book Geek, afternoon from the UK. David Batterina says, hey, hey, he brought uh, a little video to my attention that we're going to go over in just a little bit. And uh, thank you for that. I'm giving him the credit for it. Nicole's Bookish Nook says the music is hilarious, cute. Yeah, it's, uh, it is from an old SNES game called Mario Paint. And it was a, that was the, the, the music that played when you were just playing the game. It was basically MS Paint with a couple of mini games thrown, slapped together. But it was ridiculously fun uh, for when you played it. And they have never touched that, that little franchise again. And uh, they don't really hit you with a copyright strike when you use the Mario Paint music. Because a lot of that old school music is, you know, it, it's on systems that are 35 years old now. Uh, yeah, what do you mean, what? <laughs> what do you mean, what? What did I do? Thank you for joining me, Royce, from A Drink With Crazy. Speaking of which, I'll share this real quick, because this was going to be something that I was going to <coughs> talk about anyway. Excuse me, allergies. This evening, tonight, on... <coughs> Hold on. Sorry about that. I've been coughing up stuff all morning. It's just the allergies. Um, tonight on the channel, YouTube channel, A Drink with Crazy, uh, Royce and Richard and uh, Daniel, talked to him last night, forgot his name. <laughs> um, they're going to be interviewing my good friend, my boy, the master of necromancy himself, Animain, is going to be on. I'm so stoked for this, and I'm going to be there. Uh, in that chat. It is going to be fun. Uh, and I've been looking forward to this for a long time. So you guys go to over, set those notifications and join them tonight. Because uh, that's going to be a fun show. All my favorite people are streaming together. I love it. Um, Yeah, I had a different intro. I, I made it. I didn't like the intro that played for this one. I made a different version of it. It was much better. I don't know what happened. It's not on my, it's not on my, my clip list. I don't know why. Did I? I wonder if I accidentally deleted it or if it deleted itself. I've had some wonkiness with StreamYards storing video clips, and I've had to redo some. So whatever. Uh, let's see. Aaron from Wolfsbane Comic. Good to see you, sir. Thank you for being here this morning. Tim McKay says I can't get into explicit stream. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand that, and that was always my big thing about uh, streaming from StreamYard, which is. I can stream to three locations, uh, YouTube and Rumble, you know, obviously. The third one was always a big question. The one time that I did stream to Odyssey, the stream itself was not stored. Like, it did not post. Not only did no one watch, but uh, it didn't post on my timeline over there. So there was no, there's no reason to stream to Odyssey if it's not going to actually store your streams over there. And likewise, no, no live stream I do on my YouTube channel gets mirrored over there. My regular videos get mirrored over there, so I left that up. But now Rum, uh, YouTube put a stop to mirror syncing with uh, Rumble channel, so you've got to manually post your own uh, videos over on Rumble now. It's all a hassle, but I understand why they did it. Here with Darky Dark comes in, says, stream, streaming time. Yes, sir. I think it is. The Heretical Nerd says, hi, John. Good to see you. MS own, oh, hold on, owe me. Kotaki deserved to go under years ago. It, they did, and it was frustrating that they didn't. And really, the only time Kotaku ever even popped up in your timeline was when it, they had some horrendously bad take. I don't even think that they were uh, trying to uh, generate bad press with stupid headlines or stupid articles. Like, they they didn't rage bait because they weren't good at it because they actually believed the, the dumb shit that they posted. Oh, I started streaming. Uh, yeah, that's what. Oh, thank you for uh, listening, man. I know you're at work. Stop dying. Be professional. There's people here. I'm trying, man. But, the, you know, it, there's pollen in the air. The trees are fucking. What can I do? You know, it's 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 very irritating. Hey, coffee. Ah, Jolly Green says, good morning. And thank you to everyone showing up. I appreciate it. I, uh have had a lot more uh, mixture of days and night shifts and have not had the chance to do a morning stream. So I figured uh, my wife's going to try the new gym down the street and I would take the advantage the, you know, just a little time this morning uh, before some, some events this evening to just 
chill, stream a little bit, try and say hi. Usually I have a guest on, but sometimes I like to stream solo. It's been a while since I streamed solo too. And just get my thoughts out there, talk about what I want to talk about. And when I have guests on, it's fun. But sometimes I, I'll, I'll worry about having that back and forth and, you know, the, the dynamic and trying to fill, you know, make sure there's no dead air and all that other usual worrisome streamer stuff. Uh, but hopefully that's not going to be a problem. Uh, I should have probably been a little more caffeinated for this. Uh, am I doing help that? Am I doing Hell Divers 2? Uh, not at the moment. I heard that some bitch is like really big, and I don't have a lot of room on this computer. You know, this is like, let me bring this in here so I can be heard, even though I use a lower voice. Uh, Hell Divers 2, I have not played on. I, I've, I've never streamed a game before, and I want to, and I've just not sat down and taken the time to learn how, right? So it's just. It's something that's been on the itinerary that I've never gotten to. And I've been working on this uh, long form uh, video for uh, a little while now. I've been working so much that I can only work on it in little bits. That's why you haven't seen a whole lot of content from the channel aside from live streaming, uh, which is about the only thing that, that I can kind of get out these days. But be that as it may, I'm going to get to a couple of things here this morning. The first thing I'm going to get to, share this tab instead. Your My phone is right here. Why? I got it. It's right next to me. Uh, Bush McFadden says, hello, John. Hello to you, sir. Thank you for joining me this morning. Let me go to this real quick, uh, right quick. Raw, the, now, I, there, there's been, I've seen a couple people pronounce this a couple different ways. Uh, from my understanding, it's Raleigh, Raleigh Nianzi, okay? Uh, and Raleigh is an independently published author. He is uh, someone who's been in the sphere of like the pulp rev and the superversive movements on over on Twitter. He produces, he makes his own, uh, uh, his own indie books. Uh, he's very much uh, a friend of the channel and a friend of the Iron Age and all indie authors. And he does his own books uh, called The Perils of Sasha. I think it was The Perils of Sasha Reed. Royce, if I got that wrong, correct me. Uh, I don't want to take the time to look it up at the moment, but uh, Raleigh is a, a good dude. He's a big supporter of indie authors, and he got hit with a surprise bill, and we've all been there. I absolutely have been there, and, it, you know, doing, I understand this. I understand that asking strangers on the internet to help you out with a sudden bill is, it's a very humbling and it's not it's not a very proud uh, moment because most of us don't mind, you know, living our life and providing for ourselves. And sometimes you are just in a situation where it's unavoidable, you know, it's unavoidable. The only way out of it is, you know, a sudden influx of cash. A guy with a surprise bill and uh, he needs a little help. So I'm going to put the uh, link to this in the chat. Because yeah, he's a good dude. He got I don't know what the uh the bill was. He said here, I had so many plans, but oversight on my part led to a situation I'm in now. I don't make it a habit of asking people for money. Even the best of us need a little help from time to time. Yes, it, I've been there, you know, after the flood destroyed most of my house, most of my belongings, and I lost two vehicles. You know, I had no choice, and uh, a lot of people helped out. We were very appreciative of that. You need me to come lock the door? Yes, I'll see you get up. Okay, uh, I'll be right back. I got to go lock the door as my wife goes out. It give me just a second.
All right. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. Hopefully that did it. Sorry. She walked out the door and then immediately forgot her headphones. <clears throat> anyway, back to, uh, what was I reading? Right. Raul says, one thing's for sure. If you can get me over this hump, I'll move differently. No more holding back. No more baby steps. And I'll take my writing to the next level. Well, I'm not worried so much about that, Raleigh, is, you know, you being able to, you know, do what you need to do in life and get by. We're, we're all there. We're all, so you know, we're all hurting. In this economy. Whew. We all need more coffee. So I'm going to donate where I can. If you guys can uh, help out, uh, uh, help out Raleigh just a little bit. I know he'd appreciate it. And uh, this is, you know, a good dude deserves a little bit of help. So I'll put the link in the uh, description and we will go ahead and Move on to the next thing. Dude, rooting for you. I'll be donating a little later once my check drops. Okay. This was the story of the day yesterday. And it didn't really hit the same way a lot of other stories hit because uh, it, it wasn't phrased quite this way, right? Kotaku has been a nuisance in pop culture sphere for a long time. Uh, because it's full of a bunch of rancid political activist leftoids that are masquerading as uh, fucking uh, games journalists. About, originally, I think this was supposed to be about shit from uh, Japan and, and anime. And it's just one rant to take after the other because it's all the usual suspects. And um, this news drop that dropped yesterday was pretty significant. It took a little while for it to really get going. I'm not going to read too much verbatim, but basically what happened uh, is the editor-in-chief, Glenn, uh, Jen Glennon, quit. Uh, sent a resignation letter. Why? Because the management, the upper management of Kotaku over them, basically come through with uh, a, a new edict. And that edict, it, no, Bush, it was not a shakeup. No, no, and it wasn't even that. Listen, this is uh, it's not even game reviews. The This edict came from on high, and it said, Basically, okay, you're not going to be reporting the news anymore. We want all the writers, and they of which they have like seven staff writers. You're going to have to stop doing uh, news articles, and you need to start doing game guides. And they wanted them to do upwards of 50 game guides per week. So essentially, that's an impossible task. And it's intentional. It's it's an obviously intentional task impossible task to do what you ask to force them to quit basically this is the upper management this found this is a cheap way to shut down kotaku without effectively just saying oh kotaku shutting down that's why i said this took a little while for the the bomb to spread because basically this means no one this is no one's going to be able to uh to do this particular task it's it's not feasible it's not possible so they're basically forcing them to quit or they'll fire them for not being able to do what they asked. Uh, and I agree, Bush, they should have played games. They should have. Uh, it, this is one of the things about uh, Gamergate that kind of brought uh, attention to this notion that the games journalists were not uh, were not really much gamers themselves. And there was a lot of nepotism and, and uh, 
uh, favors and shakedowns going on in the industry. And that's why the industry, the industry was mad then about Gamergate. And they're mad now in the aftermath of uh, Gamergate 2 popping off with uh, Sweet Baby Inc. Because it's exposed their game. And when Gamergate first happened, there was a lot of things going on. But the landscape was not necessarily in the favor of people who were trying to fight against uh, the industry professionals. Now it is, and now it's been exposed, and now we have voices that are equal to, or if not louder and better, and have more relevance in the same spaces as uh, these other these so-called professional sites do. You know, you've got Polygon and Forbes and uh, Kotaku, uh, Game Informer. Now, IGN's not going to go anywhere, but everybody kind of everybody kind of relegates them to a space of irrelevance. Uh, PC gamer, and it's all the usual same. It's it's the same uh, shit, different day for all these uh, companies. They're the same uh, journalism flunkies that wanted to uh, write in politics, but they couldn't get jobs doing that. So they became, you know, they said, "Oh, I've played video games once in my life," and they get uh, seats as as game journalists. Now, not only is are they operating in what is essentially an outdated model of media, because we fill that role now. The, the role of a games journalist back in the day was, you know, the idea of somebody who was playing video games on a professional level, or at the very least, uh, you know, analyzing it and able to understand it and say, hey, this is a good game. This is a bad game. Let's talk to the uh, people making these games. There's been a few people who have done actual games journalist stuff and, you know, held some people's feet to the fire for, because, um, for as rancid as he is, uh, Jim Sterling has at times uh, been a voice, uh, one of the biggest, loudest voices about scummy practices in the gaming industry and calling them out. Of course, he always arrives at the same destination each time that you know, the scum games are uh, the bad game industry uh, habits are, of course, because of fucking end stage capitalism and all that shit everything's capitalism's fault because he's a, a terminally online leftoid but that's neither here nor there um and now he's he's one of them people that just can't pull his head out of his own ass and he's lost a over a hundred and fifty thousand subs because of it but we don't have uh anyone doing anything that even remotely resembles uh what journalism in by the text definition would be it's it's all clickbait. It's all feckless. I would not be shocked if a lot of these people have been using AI to write their articles for a long time and just put their own spin on it. Um, there was that one article writer. I oh guess there's so many bad examples. Someone who uh, was did some kind of a review on the PlayStation Five and he blamed it on Trump. I don't know what. God, it's it's ridiculous. They're they're not serious people. And we're starting to reach a point that I knew was coming for a long time, which is the venture capital is drying up. And the venture capital is what uh, was keeping them afloat to begin with because they knew uh, they knew that uh, they had BlackRock and all these other uh, places funding them to help keep them afloat. And because their traffic wasn't doing it, right? There's They didn't have site traffic. I've never clicked on a... I've maybe clicked on Kotaku's website once a year, right? They're not getting held up by people interested in their articles. And the the thing with a lot of these media sites, especially on Twitter, you go look at their followers versus their engagement, right? That's a that's a metric that a lot of people forget about. Because you will have a lot of people, uh, you will have a lot of people uh, that may not have, uh, that may have a huge following number, especially when it comes to industry professionals. I don't know why people just blindly follow industry professionals, whether it's games or comics or whatever, because they have this odd perceived, uh, this odd perception of fame that they really don't have. They'll have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of followers, especially if like they're a magazine, like say Slate or whatever. You go look at their Twitter account, millions of followers, no engagement. Go look at what they post, nothing. 
no one's talking about it. Some people might be sharing it, but they're more sharing the headline. They're not clicking the article. They're not going to the website. They're not interested in what it is. Everybody really reads the headlines these days. And Kotaku is just part of that group. You know, the only time they had engagement is when they said something stupid that people wanted to laugh at them about. And they don't have that anymore. <clears throat> Uh, yes, Bush, uh, they do have a lot of engagement, but it's not the right kind. Uh, their mess, their message isn't really getting spread. It's derision at them. That's getting spread. Uh, what, how does that old phrase go? The, the only thing worse than a bad movie that nobody watches is a bad movie that everyone watches. And you can take that saying and apply it to this as well. Uh, there's always been people that said there's no such thing as negative press. And that's really dependent. That's almost a case by case uh, basis sometimes because there's been uh, you know, ask Brie Larson, how good all that negative press she got did for her when uh, between Captain Marvel and the Marvels. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sorry. That sarcasm was a little lost on me. I understand it. It was, uh, but it's, it's a little, tr it's kind of true though. Lots of YouTubers talk about them because they're trashing them. And really the relevance in, especially in the pop culture and video gaming spaces has kind of gone to Nerd Roddick and the FNT crowd, Geeks and Gamers, as, you know, uh, Clownfish TV, because they have something that the pros don't. They have, uh, they have genuineness. They have authenticity. They're just fans talking about it from their perspective. And their audience found them and likes what they say. That's why Critical Drinker... Uh, is almost at 2 million subs. That's why Nerdrotic just crossed 1 million because people believe what they're saying, believe in their message, and uh, they like the content that they make. I mean, uh, I went to Movie Bob's Twitter not that long ago because it had been so long since I've uh, actually seen his takes getting passed around. I wonder, was he being quiet? Okay, so Movie Bob's got like 30, some over 30,000 uh followers on Twitter, right? No engagement. And a lot of that's because these days, 80% of what he posts is just retweeting somebody else. So if you, if your uh, timeline is nothing but retweets, people tune out of that really quickly. People do not want to see just a bunch of retweeted shit. Uh, that's why I retweet very sparingly. Um, I do, uh, you know, a couple a day, maybe three or four, if it's something that's particularly interesting to me, if it's something I really want to comment on, I'll put a comment on it. That uh, that spreads your message a little farther. But anyway, uh, Grums, uh, who has helped kick off the whole Sweet Baby Inc. Gamergate 2 thing, uh, gave a quick rundown of it. He said, uh, Glenn, Jen Glennon, uh, EIC, tweets she resigned. Angry Kotaku writers spilled the beans. They must dump news and write gaming guides. Former Kotaku head Nathan Grayson tells seven writers left, and they must turn out 50 guides a week. Now, here is Carolyn Pettit, which I, I've gone around the ring around the rosy with her on uh, Twitter a couple times, uh, who was proud of Glenn leaving. And this one popped up this morning from uh, Levi Winslow. Who's a Kotaku writer? He says, F it. Here's a small cup of tea. Management doesn't even care about the quality of the guides. They want us to aggregate them from other sites like a literal content mill. That they're destroying people's livelihood gags me not in a good way. That's disturbing, dude. Keep it to yourself. He said, last thing I'll say is this. Someone at the top told us to just get our guides done because the AV Club watches full seasons of a show and still produces their stories. That alone is proof they don't understand what we do. Um, what, what do you do? What do you do? You know, you don't do much. There's DDA Cobra, of course. Uh, it's 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 essentially the end of the company. Or at the very least, even if it's not the end of the company, it's the end of what Kotaku was, which is yeah, which is just the same old shit from a different company. They all do the same thing. They just do it across different uh, across different venues. Uh, Mega Buster Shepard, thank you for dropping in. Says, bright side, no bad economy. These people will soon be unemployed. I'm normally not uh, one to gloat when it comes to people losing their jobs, but uh, I got to say, I don't feel a hell of a lot of sympathy for these folks at Kotaku because they, 
they decided that in the culture war, they would pose themselves as uh, on one side and declare everyone else on the other side, their enemy uh, to be looked down on. Uh, they took the reins of calling gamers, toxic uh, fans, toxic people, denigrating them when they complained, calling them uh, crying man babies. And now that dick has swung all the way around and slapped him back in the face. So yeah, I'm not particularly, uh, I'm not particularly sympathetic when it comes to this. Uh, Dave Brennan, this is a brief intermission for coffee making. Uh, thank you for dropping in over and uh, showing a little love on Rumble, man. Uh, I've got to. Uh, I'm I'm gonna work over on a uh, over on a, a, a an exclusive, an exclusive uh, stream that me and Royce have talked about. It's gonna be exclusive to Rumble because uh, we've jokingly called it the blue collar stream. Because if you guys know blue collar dudes. They will sit around and bullshit and tell the best stories in the world. You will be entertained for hours. We can do it. And I I want to get an intro done before we start setting that up because uh, it, it's going to be a fun time. There's nothing better than when blue-collar guys sit around and tell stories. And I used to work in construction. I've worked in medical. I've worked in industrial plants and manufacturing. Dude, I could, I could fill an entire live stream with uh, – I could fill several live streams with just shit that I've done in my life. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're going to see who's going to be in on it, uh, Paladin. Uh, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, you know, do some stuff first. I gotta get this long form video out the way first. And I'm probably going to work on some of that today. I gotta move rubble off the G. I'm going to move the rubble off G4 off to the side to fit Kotaku in the dumpster. Yeah. And I warned several of them a couple weeks ago. I said, remember what happened? The line, because they're trying to attack the uh, gamers for the whole Sweet Baby Ink controversy and it not going away. They're at the Game Developers Concert uh, cons conference this week, and like fifty of them stood out in, in uh, the parking lot or the the little uh, yard that they have by the conference center and just screamed to get their frustration out. Like, you know, you're gonna be screaming even harder on the unemployment line. And it didn't have to be this way. They lacked the perception to understand that uh, they things are uh, the pendulum always swings back. And game, trying to tell gamers that they have to accept things that they don't want is never going to work because a lot of gamers are also uh, people that are online, and the internet always wins. There's no fighting against the internet. Uh, Christopher Brand, having your timeline flooded by retweets is a pain. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, and I agree. <laughs> As God is my witness, I thought communists could fly. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Learn, learn to code has become... Um, they, they, that learn to code thing has come around to bite them on the ass really hard. <sighs> oh, wow. You managed a gas station for over a year? Oh, wow. Um, Paladin, uh, something on the Final Fantasy series. Now, I haven't played all of them, but yeah, that would be fun. Because uh, I do I do love JRPGs. And while Final Fantasy has never been my favorite JRPG, it's always been a solid contender in the ring. And I'm kind of sitting here. I'll talk Final Fantasy for a second. I, 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 I'm I used about this on Twitter. Final Fantasy Rebirth and Remake are coming out. And now I vehemently disagree with this notion of releasing these things in parts because it feels like a monetization effort, right? Um, it, it's essentially, they've split up Final Fantasy VII into three parts. Remake, rebirth, and whatever comes next. So, you know, uh, people have been wanting Final Fantasy VII, a remake, for years. And what we wanted, what I always wanted, and what pretty much everyone wanted was basically just the game with a nice graphical update. Because you go back and you look at the blocky textures, and yeah, it's kind of laughable. It was big for the time, admittedly, because it was the jump from 16-bit to, to uh, 3D graphics. And, you know, at the time, you have to understand, give it the context of the time, it was uh, groundbreaking technology, groundbreaking visuals, um, 
I always thought Final Fantasy VII was a bit of a downer of a game, and not to mention it's so loaded with mini games that there are times it feels like it's more mini games than it is JRPG, unless you're intentionally grinding. Because every every stage you go to, you're learning some new mini game that you have to beat to progress the story. It's kind of weird, and I haven't come across a whole lot of JRPGs that, that took that approach. Um, eight was like I, I kind of I have to, I kind of agree with Spoony. Uh, I thought the story was wonky uh, and kind of stupid. I thought the characters were uh, very mixed. Uh, Squall was a really well designed character, but you know he was kind of atypical of the the you know the emo gets of the day. <laughs> and the story, when you break it down, didn't really make a whole lot of fucking sense. Nine was my first Final Fantasy. Now it's not perfect, but I loved the light hearted fantasy take. It was such a nice departure from the uh, you know the kind of gritty emo ish steampunk uh, take that the first that seven and eight took. And then we moved on to 10. Uh, and it's just, yeah, I, I know, I know, Paladin. It's, I know. Uh, all we wanted was the Final Fantasy VII Remake 2 is what the guys at Activision doing. Yes, and I agree. And that's not what we got. What we got, I'm really torn on. Because on the one hand, they're doing something that's really unprecedented and interesting. They are using it. And using the notion of multiverses, not in a really goofy way, in a very subtle way to basically, basically what they're trying to do is uh, intimate that the cast of the uh, the cast of the game of remake and rebirth are kind of aware that there's the potential the world could end, that they are aware of what happened at the end of the original Final Fantasy game, which is they stop Meteor, but because of the events that were what happened, uh, humanity goes extinct within 500 years. So really the original ending of Final Fantasy VII was the bad ending. And they're integrating Crisis Core, uh, Advent Children, all the tertiary Final Fantasy VII games that have popped up over the last 20 years or so and uh, incorporating characters from those, events from those, and essentially what is a new timeline retelling of the story but with this idea that they're aware that the ending of final fantasy 7 could happen and they could possibly alter what they've done in order to prevent that from happening which if you're going to tell a multiverse story that's not a bad way to do it they're not jumping in between multiverses but i thought it would have been a little more interesting if they had gone the way of like preventing Aerith's death or even Sephiroth, you know, Sephiroth not killing Aerith. I don't know if that's what happened at the end of this one. Uh, but it's, it's an interesting way to retell that story, but it's also kind of striking me. And this isn't really what we wanted. And I think a lot of people feel the same way. They just wanted the retelling with better, of with better graphics, you know, just a straight up graphically updated remake. And the detractors of that notion say, we'll just go back and play the original game. Okay, we want to play the original game. We just want to play it with better graphics. Why can't you just give that? And they teased it for years, and people begged it for years. And now we're getting this. And again, not giving fans quite what they wanted the whole time. That, to me, is re that's a really fine line to toe these days. Because these days, fans are ridiculous. And from the sales data... This latest one is not doing as well as uh, the original. Hold on. Uh, trying not to sniff too much, but just a little bit of nasal drip. Yes, why change it? Uh, you know, because I feel like they, they are coming from this place of they don't want to just offer the same thing over and over again. Fantasy 16. Uh, I can't say, Paladin, I didn't play it. It looked okay, but it looked a little more, a little too Game of Thrones ish, and I'm kind of tired of the Games of Thrones ish uh, nonsense when it comes to fantasy. I gotta finish this off. This is almost cold. Oh, and nothing's worse than cold coffee. All right, hell yeah, there we go. So, I don't 
Fantasy Seven, Final Fantasy. I, I don't even know if it's that bush. It's it's just different. It's just a different kind of story. But I think it's ambitious. The kind of story they're trying to do. What if they can at the end of this change the actual ending and you get the good ending where they stop Meteor, they stop Sephiroth, and humanity's not doomed to extinction? Because remember, in Abbott Children, they brought up the idea of the everyone was dying from the geostigma. They were dying from disease that couldn't be cured. And the it's just it's just interesting. But I don't think it's what people really wanted. Hail B.A. Turner, good to see you, sir. Uh, yeah, Boosh, I don't, uh, I understand that. Uh, that was actually how I got into wanting to play JRPGs, watching my friend play Final Fantasy VI for the Super Nintendo. And, uh, that was all spoiled for me and everything. So I didn't get a chance to, uh, I didn't get a chance to, uh, play through that myself. And I've always meant to. I played through maybe like the first quarter of it. Um, the Final Fantasy movies also, yeah, yeah, that movie would have been fine if they called it something besides Final Fantasy because uh, it was just a straight up sci fi movie with uh, a little bit of uh, Hideo Kojima isms going on. It thought it was a little more philosophical than it really was. Graphics were amazing for the time, but you know, when you start getting into that uh, Uncanny Valley style of CGI animation, it dates your work horribly. Uh, that's why it's really better to go with a stylized uh, way of animating something, whether it's a game or a movie. Uh, like Toy Story and Bugs Life and a lot of those early Pixar movies, they're only just now starting to really, really look dated compared to uh, a lot of... Uh, compared to a lot of, of, you know, their more contemporary offerings. So... Uh, let me go and see what else we were going to cover. I was going to cover this as well. And shout out to David Maduro. Uh, this was his. Come on now. Hide the hide the comment. There we go. Shout out to David Maduro. He brought this to my attention. Uh, David, I'm sorry. David Batterina. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, he's an independently published author. And uh, this came across his his timeline. Hollywood, so a lot of Hollywood behind the scenes people have put it out there that it is not going well for them. So I was going to bring it. This is two minutes long and I'll watch some of it. I don't know if I'll watch all of it. Um, the entertainment industry. Hold up, hold up. Let me bring this up full screen. These are some people working in Hollywood. Uh, these are like producers, editors, and some of the middle, some of the middle people working in Hollywood, right? The entertainment industry is seriously broken. I asked a few of my friends and colleagues to describe what they're going through, and I think you should take a listen. Uh, my name is Matt Hoban. I'm a former executive producer. So many of my mentors and my friends and collaborators are working less to the point where they're not working at all. We're just people trying to make a living and it's getting really hard to do that. I'm Jen. I am a former editor. I am definitely financially struggling. You may lose my house <laughs> and it's really scary. So I really need help and a job <laughs> and just uh, some support. So thank you. I'm Marsha, producer, casting director. The last show I worked on was Generation Gap. We're just trying to keep our kids fed at this point keep our house keep our cars get food on the table my name is now mind you these people live in california and the ridiculous and anyone can tell you that california is probably the highest uh, one of the highest places to live in this country especially hollywood and i guarantee you the very taxes and things that have raised uh, the price of everything in California exponentially, they signed off on by voting for the people that did it. Okay? This is a self-inflicted wound. And it's tough for everyone everywhere. But this did not have to happen. And a lot of the reason the work is drying up is because they've made bad products, bad movies, bad TV shows. The money's drying up because the audience is leaving. I know I'm leaving. I haven't had cable in years. 
I've gone to see one, maybe two movies in the theaters in the past year. I don't pay for streaming services. I am contemplating Amazon Prime because I get that from time to time to occasionally ship stuff a little cheaper. But I don't always have it. I don't have it year round and just forget about the subscription. And occasionally I do watch stuff on Prime. There, there are some shows that I do occasionally watch, like uh, Vox Machina. Well, I wonder where the third season of that is. They usually pop up by now. Um, and I'm con seriously considering watching the Fallout TV show and reviewing it. Because my son and I both, I liked uh, Fallout 3. My son loved uh, 3 and uh, 4. He, he played 4. He, he liked it okay. And he's kind of big and he's kind of a, a big Fallout lore fan. So we were contemplating watching Fallout and reviewing it together. Uh, hey, old Wrangler, good to see you, sir. Uh, it was affordable six years ago. No strikes. Yeah, yeah, the strike. And these are yeah, this these are the people who went on strike. I mean, well, no, hold on. It was the actors and the writers that went on strike, and now these guys are thinking about going on strike. Guys, what did you think would happen when you stopped working on the only thing paying your bills? What did you think would happen? What did you think would happen with people? Uh, why? re-electing a governor who basically uses the state as his own personal piggy bank. What did you think would happen? This is what would happen. This is Wilfredo Hernandez. I used to be a television editor, and I'm being forced to move out of my house because I'm not going to be able to afford the mortgage anymore. So let's try and make this very aware that we're all going through this. You're not the only one. Okay, Hollywood, a lot of people all over the place are, are going through it. And you want to you wanna, uh, know who to blame? Look in the mirror. What did you vote for? Who did you vote for? To see if we could bring some change. My name is Steve Mellon. I'm a reality television editor. Okay, no loss here because reality television is a plague. It is the most vapid, useless form of entertainment. Okay? And it, it, you're really tempted. I'm really tempted when you watch this because I can understand how this feels. I was basically forced into home ownership uh, a year and a half ago. I had to get forced out of the renting prop the property I was renting and into a house and mortgage because if I if I went into another renting property, I would basically be paying the cost of a mortgage for something I would never own. So I'm, I, I prayed about it, and I'm glad God landed us on our feet. But you know, it's don't forget. These are people that when things uh, when they put out bad products, they blame the fans for it. All they had to do was make fans happy. All they had to do was make something fans wanted and put no, but they didn't. They instituted DEI uh, hiring practices. They got activists in the writer's room writing the uh, writing a fan fiction version of your favorite uh, of your your favorite properties whether it's games, comics, whatever. They brought this on themselves and they don't realize, and I, they're not self-aware. Look at them. They're not self-aware enough to realize what they did, that what they did is their own fault. There just isn't any work out there. My wife, Stephanie, has not worked as a post-production supervisor. She's working doing uh, Instacart runs, trying to just keep her sanity and bring some extra money in. Half of my Rolodex there. Notice the derision where he says we, we're they're forced to pay their bills with uh, little side jobs. We've been doing that. Working class Americans have been doing that for the last several years because the economy has gotten so bad. And the economy has gotten so bad because why? Think about it. Who did you vote for? What did you vote for? Because if you voted for LOL, stick it to the MAGA chuds. If your vote was just because you hated Trump, you got exactly what you uh you got exactly what you voted for. You are now officially at the find out part of fuck around. They're looking for work. They're scared. They could use some help and support. My name is Erin. I'm an SVP of development and unscripted. I've been in the business for 22 years. I was laid off. I'm a single mother with three kids and the situation really stinks. It's always in the eyes. Single mom, three kids. But you can always look at the eyes and, and, and tell. I wonder why. 
trying to add the kids in is uh, a, a little bit of a sympathy is a good touch. Now my family and I are living on credit. Hi, my name is Anna. I most recently worked as a TV post producer. My insurance company is specifically targeting MPI members and taking a very long time to authorize medical procedures in a timely manner. My name is Tasha and I'm a former VP of production. She looks like a comic book character. She looks like Rogue. She's got the Rogue hairstyle. Former VP of production. I have officially been out of work for 11 months. I've applied at over 200 job postings and have not gotten a single job. Well, I hear the coal mines are always hiring. I've gone through tough times too, but it's hard to scrape up a lot of sympathy for Hollywood. It, it really is, especially when their actors, showrunners are on social media, pointing the blaming finger at fans. You know, working class people go through this and they laugh. I'll never forget Maria Sirtis, uh, Deanna Troy of uh, Star Trek, The Next Generation. When Texas had blizzards that came through and people were out of power and people were trapped and people were dying. She got up on her haughty high horse and said they deserved it because of who they voted for. And I wish I could have reached through my phone screen and slapped her because that is such an elitist fucking thing to say. And now their, their own kind are going through the same thing. Yeah. They laughed when people died. And now they want sympathy from people that they have derived, uh, have treated like shit. You'll forgive me if my heart does not go out to them. Now I've been I've been a working class guy for a long time, and so I'm not uh, uh, I'm not averse to doing what I have to do. I'll dig ditches if I have to, as long as my uh, my uh, kids got food and clothes and we got a place to stay. I am not ashamed of hard work, and I do it constantly. I basically work two full time jobs. Uh, while trying to create on the side. So a lot of times this ends up becoming, uh, you know, this is more the hobby at the moment. Hoping one day I can make it into a job. But until then, I'm going to work my ass off to feed my family, even if it's a job that I don't necessarily want to do. Which thankfully I'm, I am doing a job that I want to do, and I'm, and I'm paid well enough to do it. And what little that I have is going to end up going to uh, other indie creators uh, because, you know, times are uh, times are tough and they are making the entertainment I want to see. Hollywood is not making the things that I want to see. They stopped doing that long ago. Oh, yeah, Bosh, I forgot about that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that that was... Uh, it, it's all it's all that whole environmental thing is, is such a shakedown. And I blame the environmentalists because they have become such a powerful lobby in the government. They have poisoned our industrial infrastructure for decades. Um, you look at the damage that they did shouting down nuclear power. Sorry, Bush. Uh, they they poisoned the well when it came to nuclear power. Nuclear power is clean it's efficient it's effective but they they basically gave it the idea made it look like the uh it was going to turn uh, all our kids into three-armed mutants that it wasn't as effective and we haven't built a nuclear power plant since the 70s because of them and now they're trying to say we we shouldn't have power we should only have power from solar and wind and it's not feasible but they don't want to listen because they get money from them. And if we could purge environmentalists out of uh, the lobbying game, we probably could move forward and become even more of a, a better country and society that we have now. We could have actual progress. We could have actual jobs for the middle class. We could have a lot of things. Vote for me, guys. I'm going to do this. Yeah. <laughs> of course they did. 
Hey, remember when they uh remember when they uh basically turned their farmlands into drought because they rerouted a river all because of a a, a stupid fucking fish? I, I agree, BA. There are a few the good creators in Hollywood are unfortunately gonna get caught up in this tidal wave of uh shrinkage that's gonna happen. Hollywood's gonna shrink, it's gonna condense. And it's going to be ugly and bloody and brutal because they're excising both they're excising both people that they don't like and don't want. But with that, good people are going to get flushed out too. So hopefully, some of the bad will get flushed out. A lot of the good will, but and and that's unfortunate. Because there are people that do have some talent that are still in there. They're unfortunately drowned out by the tidal wave of shit that Hollywood puts out. That's unfortunate. But it is it kind of is what it is. And you know, it's it's kind of out of our uh it's kind of out of our 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 our, our reach and ability to really change. Uh I think a lot of us here in the indie space have kind of come into this place where, you know we're not really paying much attention to what gets released. And most of what does get released is Hollywood's interpretation of IPs and franchises that we have loved for a long time. But most of us are kind of looking to see how are they going to fuck this up this time? Uh, that's kind of where we're looking at with uh, fallout. That's about to hit halo Two, halo season two just wrapped up. And man, it's it looks even shittier than the first season. They introduced the flood, which made no sense because on in the Halo TV show, they have not actually set foot on the Halo ring yet. The arc that the Master Chief character, no one calls him Master Chief. They call him Master Cheeks because he was naked several times. Uh, and you got to see his uh, his ass. Like so, yeah, Cheeks is uh, the name of the main character in the Halo TV show. And his arc this season was, what is he like without the armor? He has to fight back and prove that he's worthy of the armor. No, no, no. This is the wrong lesson. This is not the right story to tell with Master Chief, superheroes, other shit like that. You don't take these people, you don't take your characters away from their iconic imagery, okay? Their imagery is part of their uh, their icon uh, status. This is why I highly disagree with superheroes that are constantly taking off their mask. That's an edict because of the actors. It's the same reason why uh, Master Chief is constant is more out of his armor in the Halo TV show because the actor and all the actors have it in their uh, contracts to uh, make sure that their face is on screen a certain amount of time and not hidden behind. Uh, the mask. Pedro Pascal is the Mandalorian, but he's not really the Mandalorian. The stunt guy that plays the Mandalorian is there. He's mostly Pedro mostly does voice work. And he shows up on set probably for a couple of days and shoots the few scenes that he is actually without the helmet on. To me, Pedro Pascal is not the Mandalorian, just like Cheeks is not Master Chief. The helmet is the character. That is the iconic image that people have of them. You can get away, you can you can skirt the line a little bit, but if you do it too much, it's very obvious that the actor wants to be the uh, the star. You're not the star. Chief, the, the guy that the actor that plays Master Chief is not the star. Master Chief is the star. Chris Evans is learning this the hard way because nobody really gives a shit about the movies he's in. He wasn't the star. Captain America was the star. Now, you have some guys that understand this and they step into the role so well that they become synonymous with that character. Tobey Maguire is very synonymous with the Spider-Man character. He respected Spider-Man. Sam Raimi respected Spider-Man. And they meshed well together. But Tobey Maguire did take his, his mask off an awful lot in those fucking movies. Boom. Um. Ryan Reynolds understood that Deadpool was the star. He, he did everything he could to embody Deadpool, and it worked. 
Ryan Reynolds and Deadpool are now synonymous with each other. They're basically the same character. But Pedro Pascal is not the Mandalorian. If you can even call the Mandalorian much of a character. <sighs> Yeah, the only time they made a hero right was Judge. Yeah, yeah, that was that was another good one. Carl Urban understood that. He understood Judge the, the mask is Judge Dredd. Stallone didn't understand that. I love that movie. It's 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 fun. It's hokey and, rid and ridiculous, but it's it's great. If he just kept the mask on the whole time, it would have been the perfect Dread movie. Bad sauce. Uh, no, actually, they have not seen Halo. Uh, some of the showrunners have admitted that nobody that worked on the show really played the games. They probably played it for like an hour to kind of get a feel for it. But they don't understand that uh, Master Chief is an iconic character. Uh, Bush says, John, I see Grogu and all I see is a puppet. I think that does go and end up speaking to a lot of the... Uh, uh, the suspension of disbelief has kind of crumbled in some ways. When you don't like something, the flaws in it really start to show, right? I think the Mandalorian fell under that. And it didn't help that a lot of the flaws were, like, really easy to point out. And, you know, it, it didn't have a lot going on. You can point out the flaws in Star Wars all day. Well, my God, we've laughed about the, the flaws in Star Wars for decades, <laughs> right? The stormtrooper hitting his helmet on the door. You know, the fact that C-3PO really can't move all that much. And it's okay. Because it was such a fun and, and good time that you glossed over it. We know pro professional wrestling isn't real. We know that, you know, the outcomes are predetermined. But when it was really good, you didn't care about any of that. You were being presented with a good story with fun action and you were having a good time. You were invested in it and your suspension of disbelief uh, carried over that. Lucha Underground was a good example of this. That was the last time I was genuinely into pro wrestling. When Lucha Underground came out and it, there were elements of it that were really hokey because you could, you could, uh, you knew that some of the uh, wrestlers like Drago, Drago was not really a dragon in human form. Uh, what was that guy's name that he fought with? Astro something. Uh, was not a guy from the stars. Okay. La, uh, Mil Mortis was not a was not really a man that had died a thousand deaths. It was an unstoppable. He was like the Undertaker with a lucha mask on. He was great, but the good booking and the storytelling made you believe these things, and you were really invested in uh what what was going on with them. No more taste was a great villain. One of the best, very, very underrated pro wrestling villain. Yes, Mega Master Shepard, the cream always rises to the top. I guess it's been my disbelief for these things. I didn't know the head, know the head bonkers over. Yeah, right. But it was kind of funny. People going back and watching old movies and just trying to catch all the mistakes. There used to be a website for that. It was, and it was kind of funny. Uh, they would catch all the inconsistencies because uh, it's funny to think that. To me, it's almost overwhelming to think that uh, movies are made out of order. Wildly out of order. And <laughs> it, it it's, it's just so strange. And when you look at the process of making a movie, like, it is amazing to think that almost, you know, it gets made at all. Right? There's so many moving parts and so many people involved. And you know, I honestly don't know how they do it. It is remarkable. But the fact that something so bad can get uh, put on screen like Halo, the TV show, uh, without anyone saying, hey, you do it like this, the fans aren't going to like it. And they just shake their head, brush it off their shoulders and go through it anyway. And they have all the excuses in the world, but they don't have an audience to watch with them. I have no idea how many people are watching me. It's hilarious. Because uh, right now it's telling, oh, oh, if I put my arrow, my little cursor over, it tells me where people are watching from. I never knew I had that uh, option. Interesting. So I've got 161 views over on X and nine people watching on YouTube. 
of course, I don't have any. Uh, I don't have anyone watching over on Rumble. I gotta get. I gotta find out a way to boost up on Rumble. I want to do gaming streams, guys. Tell me this: if I started streaming games on, uh, if I started doing gaming streams, what kind of games would you like me to see? Would like me to play? I like JRPGs, but I know watching someone power grind on a JRPG for hours isn't really the most exciting thing. And I have studied like really good game streamers to kind of get an idea of what they do, which is, you know, mainly they just talk nonstop. <laughs> uh, I've got a, I only have two streamers that I watch their uh, their games consistently. One's Razor Fist and the other one is J Moles. And uh, J Moles is uh, a solid dude. He know he, he knows how to game the algorithm too. like he's constantly talking about game content. He puts out shorts. He puts out daily videos and he does almost daily streams. So like he's really built up a good channel. I think I caught him when he was about two to three thousand. Now he's over seven thousand. But he's fun and he's interactive. He interacts with chat, and that's what makes his streams a lot of fun to watch. Plus, he's just a funny guy. Play what I like. Well, I, I like JRPGs, but you know, uh, I can't do. They can take upwards of like. 70 they could take upwards of 40 hours to finish a lot of them people will watch if they won't well yeah, that's true i just haven't had a time to sit down and do that i'm gonna be uh calling the stream before too long so that we can uh i can redo my background here i've got this tribute video uh that i need to work on but i can't do it until uh my little one wakes up because i can't do it with this lighting i can't have inconsistent lighting in the video but i've been working on that and i've kind of let other videos go on the wayside in order to do that. I have been reading though, and I'm almost done reading my current read, which is uh, City of Marble and Blood by Howard Angel Jones. This has taken me way too long to get through just because my time constraints have uh, gotten really high lately. And uh, <clears throat> But it's getting really good. And this is, a, this is another masterpiece. This is, a, this is such a great series by Howard Angel Jones, and I love it. Uh, I've just had so much two hours out of my day basically now to take my son to and from school. So like my, my, my time for anything now has, is severely uh, weakened. It's I've barely enough time just to do like two streams a week, which is kind of why I wanted to take a chance. And I was in a good spot to be able to stream this morning. I just wanted to do that. You know, it's good to, uh, you know, uh, chill with you guys and do a little solo stream every now and then. Um, the, uh, the review of this will probably drop sometime next week once I get done with it. And then this, uh, this book and uh, this book are going to be rehomed to a, uh, uh, to a fellow. Don't tell him uh, these are going to Andy Pelican cause he doesn't have them. And I think he would uh, really enjoy them and, uh, you know, send him a little copy of my book too. Cause uh, he likes, he's got a big shelf full of, uh, indie authors. I just want to add mine to it. A JRPG stream would be fun. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And you know what I'd love to stream? You know what I'd love to stream? Uh, and I would have to get an emulator for it. There's a PlayStation 1 video uh, JRPG called Thousand Arms. And it's this it's this fun, quirky little uh, indie, uh, not indie, uh, JRPG. Hey, bud. Hey, come lay down right here, okay? Mama's at the gym. And... Uh, YouTube removed your comment. It might have. It depends on what you uh, comment on. But anyway, uh, it's this fun little quirky uh, JRPG with a lot of voice acting in it. It integrated a dating sim into the uh, uh, the weapon and level progression. It's pretty interesting. You have to basically you have to go on these, and it, it's hard to explain off the top of my head. Basically, you have to go on dates with girls in order to uh, upgrade your weapons and unlock uh, special moves. It's hilarious. Uh, and it's a lot of fun, and it, it's not a lot of people know about it because it never really got a re-release. Why would it? It's... <laughs> uh, have I seen season two of The Wheel of Time? No. Uh, I noped out of season one. They ruined the lore very early on, and I, I'm not a fan of the creative choices they've made with that. A slight delay over on Rumble. It usually is, but I always like to make sure that it's streaming over there. But Rumble is pretty solid these days. Um, 
early on, you used to have to check out your own uh, stream just to make sure it was still playing. But it's uh, haven't had to do that in a long time. But anyway, I'm probably going to go ahead and call the stream there, guys. Um, I know we've all it's, it's been fun to talk. It's been fun to watch. Uh, it's been fun to watch. Uh, you know, just chit chat about Hollywood and everything like that. But uh, it's getting a little harder to talk with my nose a little stopped up. You can kind of tell. And uh, I've got stuff to get on and go do. Uh, but it's been fun. I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Remember tonight on A Drink With Crazy, uh, they're going to be interviewing my dude Anime, and I'm looking forward to that. I will be there in that chat. So look out for that. And I will see you guys. Irritating ass coming in like that. Yes, I, I know he's up. Hey. <laughs> I know he's up. He's right here next to me. Okay, bye. Hey, bud. Yeah. Well, my little dude's up. Yeah, Benadryl. No, I'm not getting Benadryl for myself. <laughs> not doing that, Boosh. <laughs> you guys have been fun. Uh, this has uh, been a great stream. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and, and call the stream there. And uh, see, try and see if I can figure out what happened to my coffee intro. Uh, until next time, guys. Hail the Iron Age. You have a good Friday. And be glad you're not a Kotaku writer. You don't want to lie in bed like a vegetable and do nothing. I've tried it. What do you need? What do you want? Can I not just live here without having to occasionally deal with you animals? Coffee time. Care for a cup of Wilkins coffee? No, I don't like coffee. I need another cup of coffee.